Let me first thank the school, the administration, and the committee that's invited me and tell you how grateful I am for this opportunity. The only chance that I have left to speak in this country is in the academic community. Whenever I try to speak in the streets or in my own hall, I, it results in a fight and a battle rather than a speech. This is the only chance where I have to present ideas for your judgment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I am going to try to do here today, I cannot possibly hope to convert you or convert any significant number of you. Have you come up here and say, could I please have an armband and I want to join the Nazis? I can't do that today. The best thing that I can do is show you some of the startling facts, some of the staggering, shocking facts which, was we which were withheld from me when I was in college and when I was a citizen out in business and so forth that I didn't know that you don't know. The things that changed me from an almost liberal at Brown University to a man who now stands proudly before you as the head of a world national socialist organization, and proudly so at that, because I believe I have different facts at my disposal than you do. I can't possibly convince you that I have, because I can't show you all of them that I have studied. What I'm going to try to do today is to present some samples, some of the most shocking and stunning samples of what changed me some of the facts that I think will change some of you. And speaking all over the country, I've been finding considerable success, even at the University of California. A couple of days I spoke, and I made it. I was able to survive out there, and I think I'll be able to survive in these schools because when you leave here, I think most of you will have one comment, if nothing else. He does have some facts, and I'm going to show them, some of them, to you. I'm not going to stand up here and just tell them to you because I wouldn't have believed these facts. If I were you out there at Brown University and some guy came up here and told me what I'm going to tell you today, I wouldn't believe it unless he showed me the documents and I'm going to go further than that. I can't possibly pass the documents around. I have no screen to put them on. I can't read all of them. So inevitably there's somebody who will say, oh, he's taking them out of context. That's not what the documents say. Or he's misinterpreting them. Or they're altogether fakes and so forth. So here's what I'm going to do. What I've done at every college where I've spoken I want anybody who has the slightest doubts about any of these documents to get them for themselves, no obligation, no cost, no anything except just get the documents from me for nothing. All you have to do is send us a stamped, self-addressed envelope and every... <laughs> well, I assure you I'm not going to live rich on your stamped, self-addressed envelopes. All I want to do is get the documents to you. We can't afford to send out the thousands that are being requested. I will send them to you for nothing, no obligation. Your name won't go on any list. You don't even need much of an address. All you need is George Lincoln Rockwell, Arlington, Virginia. They know where I am. <laughs> send for the documents before you dare to turn to your neighbor and say those are phony documents or he's taking it out of context. I'm going to do my best to give you some samples and I beg you, check them all, because they are shocking. They're surprising and they're almost unbelievable. So therefore, I beg you, please send for the photostatic copies, not just written copies, but photostatic copies of each one, along with the source and the citations where you can get them yourself. I'm going to go further. And I've been making this statement every day at colleges all over the country. If anybody can prove that any of these documents are phonies or I'm misrepresenting them, I will pay a $1,000 reward. Nobody has ever even tried to collect because they're not phonies. They're on the level. I'll go still further. If anybody can prove that I'm up here lying about these documents or they don't exist or they're phonies or forgeries, I will fold up the American Nazi Party and go to work for Martin Luther King and Harry Golden for nothing. <laughs> and you can be sure there's quite a few folks that would like to close up the party, and they can do it easy. All I've got to prove is I prove I'm a fake, and I'll quit. Now, the first document I'm going to show you, ladies and gentlemen, I think is the most surprising of all. It sure surprised me when I ran into it. They always ask me how I got into this business, and this is one of the documents that did it. When I saw the document here that I'm about to show you, I couldn't believe it, so I checked it with a lot more. And I brought some more of these documents to show you what I checked it with. I'm going to tell you what this document is, so if you don't care to get it from me, you can get it from the source where I got it, the Library of Congress, for one dollar to the Library of Congress, to Johnson and his gang, you can get this document <laughs> photostatted. What I have here is a full-page newspaper article in the London Illustrated Sunday Herald, February 8, 1920. On that date, right after the Russian Revolution, Winston Churchill, I'm sure there's nobody here that's going to try to claim that Winston Churchill is a bigot or a Nazi or an anti-Semite, 
Winston Churchill wrote an article about the Russian Revolution and the Jewish people. The title of it is Zionism versus Bolshevism, a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. Let that sink in a minute. He says Zionism versus Bolshevism. In the article here, he says in the first part that about half of the Jews want to be Zionists and take Israel away from the Arabs and make it a homeland for the Jews. And, and Churchill says this is good. This is what he's for. He's for Zionism from here down to here in the article. Next, he takes up the communist, atheist, Bolshevik Jews, and here's what he says. Now, remember, the words that I'm going to read you are not Rockwell or Hitler or Wallace. They're, they're Winston Churchill telling you about the Russian Revolution. And I'm going to back them up with more. Let me read you some excerpts. Here he says, In violent opposition to all this Zionist sphere of Jewish effort, rise the schemes of the international Jews. He says, The adherents of this sinister confederacy are mostly men reared up among the unhappy populations of countries where Jews are persecuted on account of their race. And parenthetically, I'm sure you're aware, the, the, the Tsar and the Russian police did persecute the Jews. He says, from the days of Spartacus Weishaupt to those of Karl Marx and down to Trotsky in Russia, Bela Kuhn in Hungary, Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, and Emma Goldman in the United States, now listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. Here's Winston Churchill describing communism. This is his description of it. This worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development, of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. He says it has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century, and he's talking about the Jews now. Listen to this. This is the one that shocked me. He says, and now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America, not Russia, have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of that great empire. Here is Winston Churchill telling you, as you think it over, that the Russian Revolution wasn't Russian. It was the capture of the Russian people by international atheist Jews from all over the world, not Russia. I know, I couldn't believe it either. I couldn't believe it either. But I got more. He says, there is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism and in the actual bringing about of the Russian Revolution by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one and outweighs all and probably outweighs all others. With the notable exception of Lenin, the majority of the leading figures of the Russian Revolution are Jews. Now listen to this. Moreover, the principal inspiration and driving power comes from the Jewish leaders. Thus, Chechirin, a pure Russian, is eclipsed by his nominal subordinate Litvinov, while the influence of Russians like Bukharin or Lunikarsky cannot be compared with the power of Trotsky, the head of the Red Army. Remember those two names? He says there's the two head guys, Litvinov and Trotsky. Now I want to show you some documents put out by the Jews. Here I have, in 1939, the Jews put out a book called Who's Who in American Jewry. <laughs> they say this is a biographical dictionary of outstanding living Jews of America. These are American Jews, and I am now about to show you a couple of fine, outstanding examples of American Jews. And before I show them to you, let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, haven't you been told, and don't most of you believe now, as I did for years, that the Jews are a religious group? They tell me why. Jews aren't a race, they're a religious group. They're people who believe in Judaism. This is what the Jews say, that they're a religious group, don't they? Well, let me tell you what this religious group includes in their directory of outstanding Jews, members of the Jewish religion. Here we have, remember I told you the two guys that, that uh, Churchill said are the two top men in the background? Well, here's one of them. Leon Trotsky is listed as an American Jew from New York. He was a tailor down there in the Lower East Side of New York before he went over to run the Red Army and slaughter 20 million Christians. Here it is, right here with the name of Bronstein. That's his name, not Trotsky. He changed it. Here is another guy on page 674. 
On page 674, who do we find Mr. Litvinov, the first foreign minister of the Soviet Union, and we find out his name is Finkelstein. I must confess, ladies and gentlemen, this shocked and surprised me. Here's the Jews. Here are these Jews listing a couple of atheists, Bolshevik, militant atheists, trying to get rid of Judaism as Jews. And the Jews are proudly included them as American Jews, even though they took over Russia. Well, you say, that may have been in the bad old days. They've reformed. The Jews aren't doing that anymore. Is that so? In your library, and that's if it isn't stolen before, you could get over there to get a copy of it. In your library, you'll find a book called Who's Who in World Jewry. They just put it out in 1965. It cost me 35 bucks to get my hands on this thing. Who's Who in World Jewry. And before I quote from this one, I want to tell you who endorses it. It's called a Biographical Dictionary of Outstanding Jews. It's published by the Jews, David McCain Company in New York. And they say these are the noble and outstanding Jews of the world. And here is a list of the people, and some of the, I'm sure some of these groups are right here on the campus and will tell you what a rat and a liar I am. Here are the out outfits that endorse this directory of great Jews. American Jewish Congress, American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, the Hillel Foundation, you got one? Ask them about this thing. Je Canadian Jewish Congress, Central Conference of American Rabbis, Jewish Theological Seminary of America, Rabbi Finkelstein and all these people all endorsed this as an authoritative and good directory of world Jews. And who do we find? On page 29, Herbert Apthecker, the chief theoretician of the Communist Party, who is the father of Bettina, who runs the riots on the hour and the half hour out there at Berkeley. Here, here in a directory of great Jews, a religious group, the Jews proudly list the head communist theoretician in America. Now, I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, if there's an equal standard of justice, can you conceive what would happen if the Christians put out a directory of great Christians and listed on page 29, George Lincoln Rockwell? Why, they'd have a fit, what an outrage! And yet, have you heard any outrage from anybody about the Jews listing the chief theoretician of the Communist Party as a great and noble Jew endorsed by the B'nai B'rith and the Hillel Foundation? This surprised me, ladies and gentlemen. I couldn't believe it. So I went and got more documents. Here's one of them. This one here has a ribbon attached to it. You can see it hanging down here. I've left it out so people can see that I'm not for that it would be forgery. It would be a penitentiary offense to fake this up because it's put out by the United States archivist, Wayne C. Grover, signed. This document, too, you can get from me in photostatic form. This is a United States intelligence report from Russia at the time of the Russian Revolution by G2 by United States Intelligence. It's in the archives. You can get a copy of it, as I did. You can get it from me free or from the archivists. I don't know how much they charge. I would like to read you two excerpts of which you can read the whole thing when you get it from me. Here is what the archivist has to say, or rather, U.S. Intelligence says, at the time of the Russian Revolution. He says, and he's talking about the government of Russia and who made it up and what it is. As you may know, the first Soviets were made up of guys called commissars. These are the people in charge of Russia. Now listen to the recitation of who they were. The time of the first Soviet, there were 384 commissars, including two Negroes, 13 Russians, 15 Chinamen, 22 Armenians, and more than 300 Jews. That's U.S. intelligence, G2, reporting to the president and the military services, the nature of the Russian Revolution, and in case that isn't clear enough for you, the guy goes another page, and he gets carried away a little bit. He makes it real clear. He says it is probably, it's on page two, it is probably unwise to say this loudly in the United States, but the Bolshevik movement is and has been, since its beginning, guided and controlled by Russian Jews of the greasiest type. That ought to be plain enough for anybody to understand. This is exactly what I found, ladies and gentlemen. I have hundreds and hundreds of documents. You look in the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia put out by the Jews. It's in your library, and you will find under the heading of the Russian Revolution, you will find them saying that the communist revolution in Russia was the product of what they call the Jewish Socialist Bund in the Pale of Settlement. Now, my point is this, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe this is good. Maybe the Jews should have taken over Russia. My point is, shouldn't you know about it 
Shouldn't you have been told about it? Shouldn't it be a subject of discussion? Should I have to come here and risk my life and honor and everything else and be told to watch out for this, watch out for this and be called naked and vicious in order to tell you the truth? What is wrong with telling you a fact? They didn't tell me in college. They didn't tell me in high school. They're not telling you. And if you don't know the facts, you cannot steer, steer the ship of state. If you don't know what's going on, if you're denied information because it's called hate, how can you decide what you want to do? Suppose you were told that it was evil and vicious to suggest that the Mafia is Sicilian. The Mafia is Sicilian. That doesn't mean that all Italians are gangsters or that all gangsters are Italian. That's insane. And yet they consistently say, because I tell you that the Russian Revolution was Jewish and that communism is a Jewish operation for saying that, they smear it all over the country that I want to exterminate all the Jews. That's in your paper today. And that's not true. They just lie. And people continually go on, and you have been good and kind enough to courteously give me a chance to prove that it's not true, for which I'm very grateful. But how many people can get into this auditorium out of the millions in the United States? They don't know what you're hearing. They're not allowed to. The papers never print what it is I exactly say. They say Rock will attack the Jews and the Negroes, and usually they throw in the Catholics, although I'm pro-Catholic. They do this in almost every paper after my speech. They say Rock will attack everybody. One paper even said I attacked Hitler. They just have no limit to what they'll say about the speeches. <laughs> well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to desert politics for a minute and show you just how unbelievable this whole business is, what they can get away with, and you not knowing what's going on. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. What would you say? Now, this isn't true. Right? Let me make this clear. I'm going to do this as a hypothesis. What would you say if I told you that the Catholics had a racket going? and that every food producer in the United States, everybody that makes groceries, was required to pay a priest to stand around or sit around in the factory and put a little C on all the products that you eat or drink. And if he didn't pay, they denounced him as a bigot and so forth, and he couldn't sell his product. You'd say, boy, this is terrible. Nobody would ever let him get away with this, would they? Well, the tribe is doing it. <laughs> I have... I have the evidence right here from their own stuff, and you can get this from us, too, and you can send for it. Let me tell you what I have right here. Those in the front row can see the big U in a circle on the front of this directory. This is called Kosher Products Directory. Now, you may think this is just matzo balls and stuff like that. This includes, this Kosher Products includes Sanka coffee. It includes almost all the food products that you eat or use, even detergents like Ajax. You will find this on here. These Jews have got an operation going that a rabbi has to put this, what's called a hexer, on these food products, or the company is harassed by the Jews. This used to be called the protection racket. You may say, well, so the, the poor Jews, they want to do this for their religious purposes. Well, then what are they charging money for? Why do they charge you to eat kosher food? Why should you have to drink kosher sake? If the Jews want to make it kosher, if the Jews want to make it kosher, they shouldn't take pay for it. They should just bless it for God. But they're doing it for dough, for cash. And if you don't believe me and you think maybe the cash doesn't amount to anything, here's another Jew named William Zuckerman who puts out the Jewish newsletter. And in the Jewish newsletter, he says down here on facts and comment, the kosher racket. And he says, boys, he's talking just to the Jews. He says, boys, we got to slow down on this hexer business, the K and the U bit, because the Gentiles are going to get wise and they'll slaughter us if they ever find out how we're screwing them. He says right in here... <laughs> he says in here that what the, the reason he's upset, he says there's one rabbi in Cleveland, one city now, Cleveland, one rabbi who has just sued the Coca-Cola company for one summer's blessing of Coca-Cola. Now how the hell do you bless Coca-Cola? Unless maybe snipped off a little the end of the bottle. One, one summer's one summer's blessing of the Coca-Cola and the paper, the Jewish paper reports the rabbi collected 30,000 bucks. How would you like that job sitting in the Coca-Cola factory saying, okay, send the next batch out. And then they pay you, they pay you $30,000 and who pays it? You do. You're paying to drink kosher Coca-Cola. Now you just multiply Cleveland, that's one city, by one summer, by one product, by all the products that you're using and drinking and so forth. And you know what the figure they come up with, a very ominous figure, six million bucks a year, they say, is being paid by you Gentiles and Christians out there to drink and eat kosher food. At one time, 
In the early days, we were going to give up. We weren't going to eat any more kosher food, and we almost starved to death. Because if you go out back, when you get out of the auditorium here, go and look on your shelves if you have a little coffee mess or a little place where you keep food or an ice box. Get out four or five cans, and you know what to look for? A little U in a circle or a little K in a circle or without the circle. The K means kosher, and the U, U means Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America. And this is called a hexer, and you paid to put it on there. Now, my point, ladies and gentlemen, let's say that this is good, hypothetically. Let's say this is a fine thing. That's not my point. My point is, don't you think you should know about it? My point is that you don't know what's going on in your own country. They're taking money out of your pocket by the millions every year, and you don't know it. And if you mention it, it's hate. You're a bigot. If you ever dare to mention this as I am, that's why I'm so controversial. That's why audiences are packed wherever I go. That's why they threaten me, because I mention the unmentionable word, J-E-W. You're all afraid to say that. Nobody says Jew anymore. You talk about an Italian, a German. Who says Jew? You say, a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Nobody has the guts to just say, I know a Jew. Now, the fellow that drove me over here was a nice Jewish boy. But I say that because that's what he was. If he wasn't, I would say he was a Jew. But that's not what anybody does anymore. I've given up being chicken and afraid. I finally said, I'm going to tell the truth as I see it. And if that's hate or bigotry and they want to throw stuff at me, kill me, put me in jail, I'm still going to do it. And this is what Americans have done down through the centuries. They have not been intimidated. And I might point out while I'm on the parenthetically, let me stop for a minute and say this. I doubt that more than one or two of you in the whole audience have ever heard me before or read anything that I actually wrote. Not what they said I wrote, but what I wrote. You have never judged me before and yet many of you have come in here wearing stars and doing everything to show that you have prejudged me. Before you came in here, you have prejudged me, and in a short form, that's prejudice. And I think most of you would abhor such a thing. <laughs> now let me, ladies and gentlemen, show you how they get away with this business. And before I do it, I'm going to have to make a confession. This is why they said I attacked Hitler in one of my speeches someplace. Before I tell you how the Jews operate this scene so you don't know what's going on and you're not allowed to find out without being called bigots and being scared to death of smears, before I show you this, I'm going to have to first confess a little dirt under my own rug. Everybody knows that I'm, I believe in Adolf Hitler. I think he was a good man. I think he made some mistakes. And one of the worst ones was book burning. I don't think there's anything stupider... Well, I don't know whether that's the book burners hissing, whether they're for book burning or against it. I'm against it.